In this scene from the movie Agora, men living in the late Roman Empire wrestle with the idea that the Earth is round. Now, I have a challenge for you. Identify the mistake in scientific reasoning they make in this clip. Now, don't focus on the false conclusion they reach. Instead, see if you can identify the faulty thinking method that leads them to that conclusion. If the Earth is round, why don't the people at the bottom fall off? Huh? And what about the ones on the sides? Why don't they slide off? Think about that. <laughs> Let me give you an example of the same error. In the 1600s, Evangelista Choricelli wanted to solve a mystery. Why does water go up a tube when you suck the air out of the top of it with a vacuum pump? To many at the time, it felt obvious. Nature abhors a vacuum. This answer, that nature abhors a vacuum, contains the same epistemological error that the men in Agora were making. Even though I'm sure this premise probably sounds much more reasonable to you. So what is the epistemological error? How is this error holding back physics today in theories like special and general relativity? And how can breaking free of it open a door to new scientific discoveries? The answers are coming up here on Inductica. Still trying to identify the error? I'll give you another clue. The protagonist of the movie Agora, Hypatia, demonstrates a certain mindset that helps her overcome the error that the men on the temple steps made. As you watch this clip, don't focus on the fact that she's getting closer to the right answer. Instead, ask what mindset she has, which is different from the men earlier, which led her to her superior view. So, what mysterious wonder do you all think might be lurking beneath the earth that would make every single person and animal and object and slave settle there? What might it be? Are you starting to zero in on it? If you have a guess, you can pause the video and write it down in the comments. See if you end up agreeing with me. As another clue, I'll explain the thought process Torricelli could have used to move past the primitive notion that nature abhors a vacuum and to identify the true cause of suction. Torricelli could have solved this problem by asking, is there any thing that could be pushing or pulling on the water which causes it to go up? When he did this, Torricelli could have realized that the air itself has weight and that it might be pushing down on the water, causing it to move into whatever regions are open to it. Normally, the air in this part of the tube is in the way, but once the air is removed by a vacuum pump, there's nothing preventing the water from squirting up the tube. So after these hints, are you ready for the answer? What's the error of the scientific method being made here? And how did these two people overcome the error? The error common to the two examples I gave, the primitive superstition that is still strongly embedded into our scientific worldview is the belief in laws of nature. Progress requires that we throw this primitive notion in the garbage in favor of a simple alternative. Regularities don't exist because nature follows laws. What are laws? Instructions issued by God? Instructions issued by the universe at large telling entities what to do? No. Entities simply exist and have natures, and they act on one another in accordance with those natures. The men on the temple steps thought that existence just had a downness to it. Things go down, that's the rules. Similarly, Torricelli's contemporaries held the statement, nature abhors a vacuum, as a kind of rule of nature. When you make a vacuum, nature fills it. Them's the rules. Hypatia overcame this error by thinking in terms of entities acting. Instead of thinking that there's just a fundamental downness to existence that would cause people on the bottom of a round earth to fall off, she instead asked what entity might be causing the downness. She asks what mysterious wonder might be lurking beneath the earth that pulls everything in. This is a first step towards a model of our solar system, a theory of gravity, and a means of navigating space. In like form, Torricelli may have made his discoveries by asking what entity causes the water to get pushed up. This reorientation opens the door to atmospheric pressure and fluid mechanics, a field which allows us to predict the weather, augment forces with hydraulics, and many other wonders. 
The concept of natural laws infects our understanding of the physical world to our cores. Almost all theoretical research presumes it, and I'll explain in a moment how it lies at the heart of flawed theories like special relativity and general relativity. Even one of the better mainstream philosophers of science, Tim Maudlin, has put forward the idea that laws are fundamental aspects of existence. Quote, Lawhood is a primitive status. I suggest we accept laws as fundamental in our ontology. Or, speaking on the conceptual level, the notion of a law cannot be reduced to other, more primitive notions." Unquote. This position is absurd. Let's analyze the metaphysics of the issue and slay this dragon once and for all. Laws are commonly understood as regular relationships among states. One state might necessitate another, like in the Pythagorean theorem. A right angle in a triangle necessitates a certain relationship among the sides. Or, in a different kind of law, one state might necessitate a later state. If air is being sucked out of the top of a tube, the water in the tube must rise. But these connections are not just connections between states. They are connections between entities. The reason we know this is because states must be states of something. You can't have a state floating freely on its own. Downness is not an irreducible fact about a certain direction. It's a relationship between entities caused by a force that the Earth produces. Since states are always states of entities, connections between states are always the result of connections between entities. When we realize this and search for these entities, we make progress. When we think of these connections as fundamental, when we accept them as being laws of nature, we stagnate. Now you might be thinking, wait a second, James, there are tons of completely proven physical principles which take the form of laws, which don't refer to any entities at all. What about the conservation of energy, momentum? These principles are indeed legitimate, but they are regularities which are the result of the nature of the entities involved and how they're acting on each other. The conservation of momentum states that a set of interacting bodies will maintain their total momentum. This isn't because they're following the law of momentum conservation. It's because when each individual body puts a force on another body, that body puts an equal and opposite force on it, causing an equal and opposite change in momentum. Momentum conservation is a result of the nature of entities, not the other way around. Now you might object here, no James, you've forgotten that the electromagnetic field can also carry momentum, and the way fields work is a matter of law. Fields aren't entities. Yeah, that's right, electromagnetic fields aren't entities, they're properties. They tell us what kind of force will happen in any given location. But properties must be properties of some entity. These fields are properties of an ether. So we can see that the conservation of momentum also summarizes information about how charged matter interacts with the ether. The rejection of the ether in the early 1900s was made possible by the faulty concept of laws of nature. That electromagnetic forces can just happen, or the fields can just exist without being an aspect of some underlying entity. Just as the entity perspective served Hypatia and Torricelli, the entity perspective can help us make progress in understanding fields today. Now we must understand that it's often useful or even epistemologically advisable to formulate principles without reference to entities in certain cases. In Lagrangian mechanics, sets of entities move in a way which obeys the principle of least action. The way a system evolves can be predicted through this principle without talking about the individual causal relationships between the entities involved. This is great for calculations, so long as you remember that they still boil down to entities acting on one another. In other cases, a regularity of action might be noticed, but the entities causing those regularities are just not understood yet. In the 1600s, Fermat noticed when light passes from one medium into another, the ray that travels between any two points takes the path which minimizes travel time. This generalization captures a pattern of action without giving an account of how the entities involved in the light and the two materials are acting one another to produce this result. And that's a good thing because Fermat had no idea what those entities might be at the time. So sometimes you should think about principles without talking about entities. But one must remember that all these regularities boil down to entities and the way they act on one another. They are not laws of nature. 
The primitive notion of laws is deeply embedded in the theory of special and general relativity and is blocking progress in understanding its phenomena. In an earlier video, I explained a common thought experiment used to demonstrate the laws of space and time. Imagine you have three vessels, a blue ship moving to the right, a green station, which we consider to be stationary, and a red ship moving to the left. Imagine you start a timer on the blue ship and the green station when they pass one another. Then, when the red ship and the blue ship pass by one another, you synchronize their clocks. When the red ship reaches the green station, we will observe that the green station's clock is ahead of the red ship's clock. The green station's clock changed more than the clocks on the blue and red ships combined. What is the cause of this difference? The standard answer is that this is just the nature of space-time. Now this is just like saying that there is a downness to existence. There's just this fundamental fact about space and time that make them work differently for entities moving through space differently. If we reject these kinds of phenomena as being caused by laws and look for explanations in terms of entities, new doors open to us, just as they opened for Torricelli and Hypatia. Since these clocks changed at different rates, there must be something, some entity acting on them differently. Entities can only act on one another when they're next to one another. That's the principle of locality. There are no cases of entities acting over a distance. Even in the case of electric and magnetic forces, a field emanates out from one object to the location of another. All action is local. So unless something entirely unprecedented is going on, there must be some entity acting along the path of the ships which is affecting the rate of their clocks. Since the effect of duration alteration apparently happens everywhere you try this experiment, this entity causing the difference must be everywhere. This is an entirely new proof of the ether and a proof that it causes duration dilation, all made possible by the insistence on the entity perspective over the concept of natural law. This kind of entity perspective is already implicit in the Lorentz ether theory which the dialect channel has developed and explained in many of their videos. Lorentz ether theory gets all the same results as special relativity, but explains them in terms of the effect that an ether has on the lengths of objects and the duration of their internal processes. According to a hypothesis shared by both members of the dialect organization and the inductical organization, matter is fundamentally a quantum wave, which means that it's a wave in the ether. As a result, it might be the case that processes of change, for example, the change that drives a clock, is the result of some kind of wave phenomena going back and forth within the object. When the object moves, the internal wave which constitute its inner processes of change have to go diagonally through the ether, making it take longer to go back and forth. This is a very reasonable entity-based hypothesis for the reason duration dilation happens. In this other video, Dialect explains how motion through the ether can account for length contraction. In a video a couple weeks ago, Chantal Roth, a contributor to Inductica, put forward the hypothesis that gravitation is not a bending in space-time, some law, but rather that it's caused by a densification of the ether caused by massive objects, that it's caused by entities. Progress in physics has already been made by Lorentz, Chantal, Dialect, and myself by implicitly rejecting the law perspective and looking for entities. What other mysteries might we discover once we make this rejection of laws explicit and consistently think in accordance with it? The faulty notion of laws of nature is not just in relativity. You can find it infecting every line of research in physics today. Open any paper in theoretical physics and you will see reams upon reams of math trying to explain known physical laws with further physical laws. There will be very little to no references about entities, their identities, the way they act on each other to produce the effects we observe, or anything of that nature. Rejecting the notion of laws and embracing the primacy of entities will help end this madness and point our minds in a more productive direction, just as it did for Hypatia in the movie Agora and for Torricelli in real life. Now there's a big counter argument which has been on many of your minds this whole time. James, I don't want to reject the concept of laws. The concept of physical laws is really useful. Everyone uses that language and it's going to be confusing to people if we try to change it. I get that everything is really entities and the way they act, but we have a phrase for entities and the way they act. It's just called laws. Isn't this just a matter of semantics? So for the many of you who are making this objection, I want to first point out that you agree with me. 
You agree that thinking in terms of laws in the form of disembodied rules or divine decrees is harmful to scientific progress. You are agreeing, at least in your words, that we should look for entities. You're just resistant to doing the work required to change your mindset on this so that it actually shows up in your actions. Or you're shrinking from the responsibility to communicate this important truth to others by refusing to oppose the phrase laws of nature, the phrase that names this harmful perspective that we have to overcome. Turn. If you can see that I'm right, but you don't want to put in the effort required to benefit from this knowledge, okay, it's your life, but you're going to miss out on the opportunity to become a better scientist. But if you are willing to put in the effort and stand bravely in the face of other people thinking you are crazy, you can start practicing this superior scientific perspective today by purging the word law from your vocabulary in favor of words like principle or generalization. Changing the way you use these words is a great easy first step towards training yourself to notice this subtle issue when it arises. By the way, I'm still working on this too. You'll notice that I've used the word natural laws in past videos. We all have work to do. Put in the effort and you will become a better scientist. Once we automatize this mindset, new doors will open to us. For example, consider Noether's theorem. Noether's theorem identifies the fact that all physical conservation principles that are known to us so far can be deduced from certain symmetries. So for example, if one translates a system, that is, moves it, all of the conditions remain the same. From this symmetry, I've been told the principle of momentum conservation can be derived. I have not made a full study of Noether's theorem, but my current position is this. It seems like a legitimate principle identifying some actual connection between facts. However, because that connection is not in terms of entities, it means that there's some entity or entities and their natures hidden behind this principle. Now, as I've explained in prior videos, and as Chantal is currently explaining in her videos for Inductica, there's a lot of evidence that since matter, light, gravitation are all fields, they all might be perturbations of one single medium, the ether. If this is the case, it's a reasonable hypothesis that Noether's theorem is telling us something deep about the properties of the ether. That's just one example of how the primacy of entities perspective can open new doors into the unknown. And this whole video as a whole has been an example of the fact that all of the problems with modern physics are problems of philosophy. If we are to overcome these flaws and launch ourselves into the next level of scientific inquiry, we must understand new mindsets, new philosophy. In the words of Sir Francis Bacon, if we are to achieve things that have never before been accomplished, we must employ methods never before attempted. Embrace the primacy of entities. Exercise the effort of self-improvement required of you as a scientist to purge your mindset of the concept of natural laws and reap the rewards of understanding the cutting edge in philosophical technology. And I hope you will join me in the new year as we continue to push the boundaries of physics and to build the philosophical weapons which will help us one day conquer the ether. Thanks for watching.